there shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission, one message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to one hour of uncensored news, views, and commentary. Yale Professor Charles Perot will be here in 10 minutes to discuss the very dangerous procedure scheduled to start sometime this month in Fukushima to remove over 100,000 spent fuel rods sitting on top of reactor number four. Not trying to be a drama queen, but... This operation has the potential to become a catastrophic calamity that could contaminate the entire planet with radioactivity. Uh, Chris Steinle pointed out to me this morning what the Bible says in the 11th chapter of um, Revelation, verse 18. It says, "The The nations were angry, and your wrath has come in the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and listen to this, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Have you ever seen that in the Bible? God will destroy those who destroy his earth. Well, let's look at the uh, headlines today. Talks in Geneva with Iran and Western powers have broken down. BBC reported that Iran backed out of a deal on its nuclear program. There were reports that France insisted on terms that were far more stringent than Tehran could swallow. Secretary of State John Kerry blamed Iran, not France, for the collapse of the diplomatic negotiations. Depka.com reported that the pushback against the deal was led by an unusual alliance between France, Saudi Arabia, the Arab Emirates, and Israel. Sources told Debka.com that the new European-Arab-Israeli alliance against Barack Obama's policies is a groundbreaker for future cooperation. Israeli newspapers reported that informed sources said that President Obama and Mr. Kerry were rushing to sign an agreement with Iran in order to block Israel from attacking the Islamic Republic. Meanwhile, Russian President Vladimir Putin and Saudi King Abdullah held a telephone conversation Sunday to discuss Iran and Syria. A Russian missile cruiser docked today at the Egyptian port of Alexandria, the first time a Russian warship has been in Egypt since 1992. And the foreign ministers of Russia, China, and India met in in New Delhi over the weekend to discuss implementing a radical new military security architecture between the three countries and Asia somewhat of an alternative to NATO. And while China, Russia, and India are plotting a new military alliance to rival NATO, Chinese PLA boots will be on the ground this week in Hawaii. Now, the mainstream news media is not reporting it. They want to keep us in the dark about this one. Uh, But what you need to know is that FEMA, the FBI, and other federal agencies, plus numerous electric utility companies, across the U.S. will participate in Grid X2, a national drill to plan for a major cyber attack on the U.S. power grid. The two-day drill is scheduled for this Wednesday and Thursday. Officials say it will not go live. There will not be any blackouts. But this is what is, I, I find, chillingly just bizarre that this is taking place the same two days. Uh, hundreds of Chinese PLA troops will be in Hawaii conducting an emergency preparedness drill, same days, to train with American troops in responding to an unnamed disaster in an unnamed country. Uh, This is the first time in history that communist PLA troops will be training on American soil. You know, I have to ask, uh, could they be preparing to evacuate Japan and other Asian populations 
and bring them to the United States in the event of a nuclear disaster in Fukushima. Philippine President Benigno Aquino has declared a state of calamity in the aftermath of Typhoon Hainan. Astonished hurricane experts described the typhoon as off the charts, the biggest and most powerful hurricane in recorded history. Survivors and first responders described the horrific destruction on the flattened islands as apocalyptic. The government's official death toll is 1,774, but officials say at least 10,000 people may have died on the island of Leyte, where eyewitnesses report that corpses are hanging from the trees. Leyte's capital city of Tacloban was completely submerged by 40-foot ocean waves. Eighty percent of that city's buildings were destroyed. Uh, Once again, you and I have witnessed an unprecedented event, the biggest, most powerful hurricane in recorded human history. Just consider what you and I have witnessed in recent years, the Andaman Sumatra earthquake and tsunami, December 2004. Three three hundred, four hundred thousand people killed by a tsunami. Katrina in 2005, the Haitian earthquake in 2010, the Fukushima earthquake, tsunami, nuclear meltdown trio in 2011, and now Typhoon Hainan, which is being described as the biggest, most powerful hurricane in history. So what is up ahead? What calamities are coming in the next five to ten years? as the world races towards the apocalypse. Jesus said, You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in many places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Notice he said the beginning of sorrows. And then what comes next? He said, Then they shall deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Many will be offended, will betray one another, will hate one another. Revelation 20 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or in their hands. Last week I posted on truenews.com a businessinsider.com article that originally appeared on on slate.com. The business insider writer said that the recent shortage of execution drugs in America inspired slate writer John Cruzel to suggest that the guillotine may be a more humane way to kill criminals than lethal injection. Now, this was in a major news website, a business news website, one of the most popular business news websites on the Internet right now, businessinsider.com. And the article noted that uh, Slate journalist Krizel touted the guillotine as the fastest, simplest, and most painless method to execute people. And it noted that Jay Chapman, the man who invented the three-drug cocktail used by prisons to execute prisoners, said he's not opposed to bringing back the guillotine as the preferred method of execution. My friend, you and I haven't seen anything yet in comparison to what is ahead before Jesus returns. Never forget our Lord's words, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Time to take a short break. Yale Professor Charles Perot will join me when I return to talk about the very dangerous project that will start this month in Fukushima. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. You're listening to True News, the end time newscast. This is Max McLean. In the power of the Holy Spirit, how does Christ want us to respond to personal attack and accusations? Listen to the Bible from Philippians 2. Do everything without complaining or arguing, 
so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. From Philippians 2, listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. Hear more at radiobible.org. That's radiobible.org. You're listening to True News, your alternative source for global news, analysis, and commentary. I'm Rick Wiles. Tokyo Electric Power Company will begin any day this month an extremely dangerous procedure to remove over 1,500 highly radioactive nuclear fuel assemblies, each containing many spent nuclear fuel rods. The assemblies are perched 130 feet above the ground in a cooling pool atop reactor number four at Fukushima. Each assembly weighs over 500 pounds. This procedure has never been attempted before at any nuclear plant. One accident could trigger a catastrophic nuclear disaster that could impact not only Japan, but the entire world. How dangerous is it? How concerned should we be about the procedure? How prepared should we be to respond to an unprecedented nuclear disaster? Yale Professor Charles Perot has been speaking out on this very dangerous procedure, and he's on the telephone with me right now. Dr. Perot, welcome to True News. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Well, sir, I have been very concerned about Fukushima for two years. I, I've never believed that that this uh, problem was solved. Um, I've, I've, I've tried to keep our audience informed that, uh, you know, you, you don't take the fire department over and put out a fire at a at three reactors that are in meltdown and that this is going to continue possibly for centuries. We're now going into a very dangerous phase because they have to remove these fuel rods that are the assemblies that are sitting on top of, of reactor number four because if there's an earthquake or a typhoon, God forbid, a typhoon the size of, of Hainan that just just devastated the Philippines, if something like this would hit Fukushima, the entire thing is coming down. So what what are your thoughts about this? As, as you know, TEPCO is getting ready to begin this procedure any day. Uh, I'm very worried. This is a uh, unprecedented uh, attempt, a very delicate procedure, and TEPCO's record in handling everything since the uh, disaster in March of 2011 has been very poor. They have used um, subcontractors to carry out uh, tasks, and they can't even avoid overfilling uh, uh, radioactive water storage plants. So I am uh, very concerned that they have the ability to undertake this task. Sir, I I think uh, not only has TEPCO been incompetent, but they've been downright deceitful. They've lied throughout this entire process. They have lied, and I've just, just learned that uh, they're also conducting denial-of-service attacks on anti-nuclear groups in Japan who um, have their websites... Um, uh, swamped so they cannot uh, carry out their usual information business. So it's not just lying, but it's uh, uh, more deliberate attempts to shut down anti-nuclear sentiments. There really has been a, a news blackout for two years. The mainstream news media in the West doesn't talk about Fukushima. The general public, if you asked the, the average person on the street about Fukushima, they would scratch their head and say, oh, that's old news. That, that happened a couple of years ago. And so the public doesn't know what's going on. That's true. Uh, as a matter of fact, not even many people in Congress in the U.S., I think, know what's going on. Ron Wyden, a senator, U.S. senator from Oregon, is extremely concerned and has been pushing very hard to 
to have an international team of experts take over the process. Uh, but I asked my congresswoman, uh, Rosa DeLora from uh, Connecticut, if she was in touch with uh, Biden on this issue, and she did not know about the spent fuel problem, was uh, was surprised to hear about it. This is a uh, that's troubling. Uh, that's troubling to hear that that level of um, of uh, members of Congress not being informed about something this serious. Absolutely. And we can blame TEPCO for keeping it quiet. And I'm very critical of the New York Times. Um, I'm told that they are now running a story about the danger. But a few weeks ago, they the, their main story on TEPCO concerned the uh, poisoning of the uh, Pacific Ocean, which is important story, but not nearly as... as um, imminently catastrophic as the uh, spent fuel rods removals. Has the news media been quiet because they're just ignorant and uninformed of what is happening? Maybe, maybe they don't have Internet access at the Washington Times and, <laughs> and, and the New York Times, you know. Perhaps they, they can't access the stuff like you and me. Um, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Are, are they – are they just ignorant of, of what's going on, or is this the result of the influence of the nuclear industry? Uh, it's two things. I s- certainly think the, the nuclear industry, which has denied that there will be any serious results from Fukushima, incredibly enough, uh, the nuclear industry has been very active in keeping this quiet. But there's a more basic uh, cause behind this, uh, the nuclear power industry was started to sanitize the nuclear weapons industry and nuclear bombs um, uh, by uh, the United States from the very beginning. This was to have the peaceful atom so that they could go ahead with creating nuclear weapons, which they did in by the thousands and thousands. Uh, so that has to be considered. Uh, the U.S. government uh, is very big on nuclear weapons, and uh, the daughter of the nuclear weapons program is nuclear power, because that would be the positive view of it. I think it's actually a bad seed as a daughter, uh, but uh, that's not the way the U.S. government feels. Or the International Atomic Energy Association or even the World Health Organization. Dr. Pearl, why has the Japanese government allowed TEPCO to remain in control for two years? I'm not an expert on Japanese uh, politics, but... Um, but uh, it, it is bizarre, isn't it? I mean, this a, a disaster of this magnitude, and they allow a private company to be in charge of it? It is, but... What are the alternatives for them? Uh, They have no governmental agency that has anywhere near the knowledge to to, uh, step up and handle this. To get that kind of knowledge, you would have to go international. You would have to start with the Russians, who have some experience with this. Dreadful experience, but it is experience. And uh, the Russians have uh, turned, have uh, covered Chernobyl with concrete and made a sarcophagus of that. And that has been recommended for um, Fukushima uh, from the start. Uh, But I don't know who the Japanese government would turn to within Japan that would be any better than. The very faulty TEPCO. I, but I think I think you've explained who they need to turn to. They, this needs to become a an international response. Uh, you know, I, I'm surprised they have not called in experts from around the world to say we are we are facing a catastrophic disaster and the world is at peril, and so we need all of the available expertise to solve this problem. And, and, you know, the Japanese government itself is not even calling the shots. Again, they're letting TEPCO decide 
how this is going to be handled. And and TEPCO is both inept and deceitful. And certainly they're not going to own up to the disaster that they've caused. I, I'm just surprised right. that, that the international community has not demanded a, a seat at the table. Uh, it, you can push that even a little further because they've had almost two and a half years to do so. Because from the very beginning, we knew about the status of a unit number four spent fuel rod pool uh, in a shaking building. And as a matter of fact, uh, the uh, TEPCO has uh, taken steps to uh, reinforce the building so it won't be so vulnerable to a typhoon or earthquake. But this has been uh, two and a half years in which uh, the IAEA and uh, other uh, UN uh, organizations have uh, uh, not stepped up to the plate and demanded a role uh, in um, helping or taking over from Japan this job. There are some international experts on site now, uh, including some from the U.S., Uh, so they have made a small step, but uh, they have turned it over to a subcontractor, and uh, the subcontractor has selected uh, 36 people who will operate two hours at a stretch in teams of six during the daylight hours, attempting to remove the rods, and it's going to take a, at least a year. So we should tell all earthquakes to please be careful and stay away from Japan for at least a year. Yeah. Absolutely. And typhoons and uh, tsunamis. Um, If if My understanding uh, is each fuel assembly has something like 80 fuel rods. And so there's something like uh, 100,000 fuel rods sitting on top of reactor number four. That's right. The the figure 80 is um, kicked around. Also, it's 100 and 120 fuel rods, but that's kind of... Okay, so 80 to 120 fuel rods inside each assembly. And yes, and there are 1,500 assemblies uh, in uh, unit number four now, 1,500 and... 315. I think it's 1553 is the, the number. Yeah, something like that. I, one, one person knowledgeable about the, the procedure described it as playing pickup sticks with, <laughs> with radioactive sticks. That's right. And uh, another um, expert, Arnie Gunderson, said uh, take a cigarette pack and uh, crush it. And uh, a bit, and then try to remove one cigarette without it breaking, and without it breaking the adjacent cigarettes. So that's another mm-hmm. uh, image in addition to the pickup uh, sticks. Now they built a um, rather fabulous uh, steel structure over the um, uh, up along the side, and then stretching over the uh, pool, and they have a huge crane. There and they have successfully removed two assemblies of new uh, rods which uh, had not been used yet, and that was easier because those do not have to remain in uh, in uh, water because they haven't uh, been uh, partially um, activated. Uh, so they do have an impressive structure, and they have an impressive video of how it's going to take place. And uh, it's it's interesting because what happens is they set a canister in in the water next to the uh, assemblies, and they take this pulley assembly, which is uh, about 15 feet long, weighs uh, almost 600 pounds. They pull each assembly out underwater, move it over to the canister, which is underwater, insert it into the canister. They fill up the canister with six or eight of these assemblies. Then they put a lid on the canister, which is filled with water. You've got to remember that. And then they lift the whole thing out uh, of the, um, uh, the building, lower it to the ground, put it on a truck, specially built truck, which which then drives about 50 meters, um, 
couple of hundred feet, and uh, to uh, the in-ground storage pool, which has 6,000 of these assemblies in it already, and adds them to that in-ground storage pool, and then uh, they start uh, with the next one. It's a, a long process. It's going to take, I would assume, some hours for each canister to uh, be filled and to be, be carried it out. So, so th- this is going to require human uh, workers right there on on top of Reactor Four, m- physically yes. moving these rods. Uh, they will be moving them with a crane, of course, mm-hmm. and. Uh, television cameras. Yes, there's a team of six which will be handling the removal and then others on the ground will carry out the transport uh, uh, system. And those teams of six will work just two-hour shifts. Um, And there will be a special team that works overnight. They can't do do it during the day. Overnight that hunts through the uh, pool with ro- robotic devices to find broken uh, assemblies or broken parts because the roof caved in with the explosion. So there's uh, the uh, remains of a roof in the pool, physically in the water with the, with all the, uh, the rods. The roof was thin uh, and probably didn't do too much damage to the uh, uh, assemblies. But it could have done some. What what could go wrong in this procedure? Well, the I don't know for sure that the building uh, is uh, level because there's been 31 inches of subsidence from the groundwater that's pouring in from the uh, other three reactors that are being washed, covered with uh, cold water. So there's been uh, uh, substantial subsidence, and presumably they know whether it's level or not. But if it's not level, or if it sinks a little bit during the next year of operation, you can't very easily vertically remove the assembly without it brushing adjacent assemblies. And if it does that, all hell could break loose. If one assembly touches another assembly... Yes, because it knocks off the very thin zirconium cladding, which uh, prevents the um, uh, the fuel from um, uh, uh, fissioning, from uh, starting to burn. Uh, and that uh, zirconium cladding is a protection. Uh, if that zirconium cladding gets into air, it will burn. It's, it's like a... Um, it's the same material that's used in old-fashioned flash bulbs, mm-hmm. the camera, and it'll go poof like that. And uh, then that will create an enormous amount of damage. Uh, the, the, the worst problem of all, which is not often mentioned, is that if we have an accident with the um, uh, any of the 1,500 assemblies on top of unit number four, we would have to abandon the site. If we have to abandon the site, and we would probably have to abandon Tokyo at the same time, then we cannot keep the 6,000 assemblies in the spent, in the in-ground common pool cool, because those will boil off unless they get cold water continually rushing over them uh, at all times. It will probably take uh, uh, two or three uh, or four days for all the water to boil off so much so so that the zirconium uh, lining will uh, burn and the radiation will be released. But the radiation from 6,000 assemblies, uh, well, it would take about uh, 40 days to circle the the northern hemisphere. And that this, uh, you could uh, you could move to the southern hemisphere and uh, preserve your life for maybe a month more. What? You want to repeat that? 
there are 6,000 assemblies. Uh, first, the, the, um, the 1,500 in the spent fuel rod is 14,000 times the, the uh, radioactive cesium of the Hiroshima bomb. 14,000 times that. In one assembly? Yes. And there's 6,000 no, no, assemblies? Not in one assembly, in the, in, in the 1,500. Oh, okay, uh, combined. Yeah. So what's sitting on top of reactor number four, and we're not even talking about the other reactors, what's sitting on top of reactor number four is, is equal to 14,000 times the cesium that was in Hiroshima? That's correct. That's the estimate. So now you add to those 1,500 the 6,000 that are in the common pool 50 meters away, and you've got an enormous amount of radioactive cesium and strontium-90 and uh, other dangerous um, results of um, uh, atomic power. And so if we had a reaction... The radioactive material would circle the northern hemisphere within 40 days. Something like that, yeah. Um, would there, exactly. do, you, do you think that there is any place on the planet that would be safe? No. Uh, eventually, it will drift down to the southern hemisphere. Um, uh, but, uh, no, it would not be safe. Now, it's, it's, people are not going to die instantly. Uh, radiation poisoning takes its time. It's very painful. Uh, so uh, the death rate is going to keep mounting. Uh, and uh, so people will survive, if you can call it that. There's, a, there's uh, a jet stream in the north and a jet stream in the south, but there's a band along the equator, north and south of the equator, where there is no jet stream. Do you think that's a possible safe zone? Uh no, I wouldn't think so. No, it. Uh, what happens in the north eventually spreads to the south. Mm-hmm. We learned that from the uh, atomic bomb tests, um, which were uh, in Nevada, Utah, and then were in the uh, Pacific, uh, 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 the uh, famous one at Bikini Atoll, uh, and that uh, eventually covered the earth. Oh, this is frightening. Yeah, this really is frightening. It certainly is. Can, can you imagine the stress level that will be in the workers? I would hate to be a member of one of those teams. Um, they would uh, be the first to go. But also uh, just the, the stress of knowing that if you mess up, the, the whole planet could go. Pick up sticks. Yeah. 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 And, I mean, the odds of getting through this for a year uh, without one slip-up, with one accident, not ha- I mean, th- these odds are astronomical that, uh, that they're going to make it through a year without a, you know, a, a mess-up. The odds are, are big. I wouldn't call them astronomical. Um, the engineering makes sense. Uh, there's... It's glitches that are going to be the problem. Mm-hmm. If they find that uh, uh, one of the assemblies that they're trying to pull up is broken, I don't know what they're going to do. That's going to be very difficult to remove a broken rod and uh, get all of that dangerous material out and into a, a casket. But it's not impossible. So the odds are not astronomical. So the procedure requires that the workers do exactly what uh, it, the procedure calls for, and then when you complete one fuel assembly being moved, you do the next one. You do one at a time. Yeah, I think it's – I forget exactly, but I think the casket that is going to be used to remove the assemblies can take uh, six or eight uh, full assemblies and mm-hmm. be filled up, be filled up, filled with water. It'll be underwater anyway, and then uh, uh, gradually uh, raised out uh, with the crane. Um, this is not impossible, but it's going to be very difficult. And the the big problem is they have to do it soon because we just had uh, a few days ago uh, another 
five, I think it was 5.1 earthquake in that area. Um, it, it rattled Tokyo and it rattled Fukushima. And it's an earthquake zone. And they've had as high as a seven uh, in that, but it wasn't close enough to Fukushima to do more than cause a, a one foot high tsunami. Uh, but this is a, we have built these plants in one of the most earthquake zones on the planet. So this is the original madness of, of doing this. And it, 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 madness is the word, because the, how do you explain putting nuclear reactors on top of earthquake faults? Right. Well, they... Um, the, the, most of the faults were discovered afterwards. I'll, I will give them credit for that. Uh, but they certainly should have built the um, protective wall much higher at Fukushima. And uh, the, the other ones that are uh, nearby, um, there is uh, another one. I can't even pronounce it. It's OK, OK, O something, a uh, nuclear plant, which is not far away. Uh, and was hit almost as badly by the earthquake and the tsunami as Fukushima was. But they had the sense to build it, uh, to construct it 15 feet higher than was called for in the original drawings as a safety measure back in the 1960s. And that had no problems at all. It went to a controlled, a fully controlled shutdown within 24 hours. The plant was shaken. Uh, the tsunami hit, but it didn't reach the plant. So uh, that was one that was safely built on this earthquake-prone um, island. Uh, but there are others that were not safely built, obviously. So I should revise my statements that said it was madness to build them mm -hmm. there without enormous protection from earthquakes and tsunamis. And some of them did, do, do have that protection, but many do not. Going back to the procedure, if I hear you correctly, uh, the procedure is, uh, is uh, solid and, and sound, but it's uh, fraught with danger. So you're not concerned as much about the procedure that they have to carry out to remove the fuel assemblies as you are about the possibility of glitches, of unforeseen problems. Okay, two points about that. I am, I am not an engineer. Mm -hmm. So if I should be worried about the procedure, I don't, I don't have the uh, – uh, maybe I should be, but I do not have the qualifications. Mm -hmm to even be worried about the procedure. It looks impressive on their video. It's their video, though. Uh, but your second point, the glitches, is what I have uh, studied for uh, since uh, Three Mile Island. Um, I wrote a book uh, called Normal Accidents and saying that if the system is sufficiently complex and tightly coupled, it may take a long time, but at some point there's going to be an accident that no designer could have anticipated and no operator could know how to respond to. And that was the case at Three Mile Island and many other uh, accidents since then. So I am very sensitive to unexpected failures and especially the unexpected interaction of multiple failures. So if two or three things if two or three two or three things go wrong, any one of which they can handle with a safety valve or an alarm or a backup or something like that, any one of them they can take care of. They plan for that. But they can't plan for the unexpected interaction of two or three of these at once. And that is a possibility at Fukushima. Over the uh, the past two years, I've I've monitored um, things that are happening in the Pacific news uh, that I I suspect could be connected to Fukushima. 
uh, for example, the the die off of marine life, uh, dolphins, manatees, uh, other wildlife, um, unusual illnesses in marine life, skin lesions, um, Alaska Airlines flight attendants, skin lesions, hair loss, et cetera. What, what do you know uh, from the experts you've talked to? How extensive is the the um, contamination of the Pacific right now? Well, let's just take the contamination of uh, Honshu Island, where uh, Tokyo and Fukushima reside. Um, there's been very good studies about the um, die-off of uh, bird life and animal life, uh, they, uh, and the mutations that take place, genetic mutations that uh, produce um, uh, offspring that are not viable. Uh, so we know quite a bit about uh, what's happening on land. Uh, we are slower to understand what's happening in the uh, marine life, uh, but there's been uh, a, a real problem with um, sea lion calves, the, the offspring of sea lion in the, the uh, Pacific coast of the U.S. Um, they're dying off at a rapid rate. The um, uh, fish popula- the um, anchovy population around British Columbia, which is a big industry, it's a uh, it's a great place for catching anchovies, and they're shipped around the world. It's one of the primary sources. Uh, that population has crashed this year, and the anchovy uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, fishermen, are going out of business. And they expect that that is uh, related uh, to uh, the poisoning of the ocean. Uh, the uh, sockeye salmon have a trade, uh, have a trade route, have a um, migration route uh, from Alaska over to Honshu Island and back. And uh, that uh, population has declined significantly. So we've had uh, over two years for the leakage into the ocean to show up, and it's um, uh, uh, you know 500 gallons a day for uh, two and a half years, and it's some, sometimes much uh, much higher rate of uh, leakage of uh, radioactive water into the ocean. Do you, do you think it's safe to eat seafood, salmon, tuna from the Pacific? No. Neither do I. I. I stopped. I haven't stopped because uh, I'm at, a, at uh, an H and age where it's before it could affect me, I will have died of other causes. Uh, so I haven't stopped, but uh, I recommend to my granddaughter, who lives in Berkeley, California, that they be very cautious about the amount of seafood from the Pacific that they uh, consume. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it doesn't take a lot of isotopes uh, you know, to, to, to eventually kill you. Once you get one in your body, that's, 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 uh, that's sufficient right there. Um, right. We've got a debris field from Fukushima the size of Texas moving towards the West Coast. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it? No. Why? That uh, the radioactive uh, materials get washed into the ocean. Worry about the bluefish tuna, bluefin tuna. Mm-hmm. Uh, the debris is not going to be uh, radioactive, I don't think. Uh, th- I read this, and I don't believe everything I read from uh, um, government scientists, but uh, this makes sense. But as far as uh, I mean, aside from the radioactivity uh, of the of the debris. It's just the the fact that there is a floating junkyard out there in the Pacific. Yes. And it's going to be there for a long time. Another scientist told me that it it would take eventually – it would take 60 years for uh, that debris field to be deposited on beaches, you know, as it circles the Pacific. Um, You know, it'll make – I forget how many laps it's going to make over the next 60 years – uh, but it's going to be out there for a long time, and I, you know, I've wondered about about sailing the Pacific. You know, I, I mean, what do you do if you if you you know if you're on a sailboat and um, you know in the middle of the night suddenly you're 
you're you're facing you know a couple houses and and vehicles <laughs> floating in front of you. If you can afford to sail the Pacific, I'm not going to feel sorry for you <laughs> for running into a house uh, near Midway Island. Um, I, I would envy you. I'm a sailor too, and I we run into the stuff in the Long Island Sound and uh, off of uh, Nantucket. Um, and uh, this, the uh, 60 years, uh, that won't, it'll take much longer than that for a styrofoam uh, to break up uh, and the kind of stuff we see uh, floating in the Long Island Sound. Do, do you know if, if radioactive particles are still entering the atmosphere? Oh, sure. From units uh, 1, 2, and 3. Um the, uh, the I saw a interesting um, report from a reporter visiting the plant, and when they were driving by the uh, units one, two, and three in order to get to unit four, their dis- d- those sometimes went off into the the thousand range. When they got to uh, the spent fuel uh, pool building, they it dropped to about two hundred. Uh, that uh, radioactivity that the, the dosimeter uh, was measuring is going to the dosimeter and is going into the atmosphere. So it is still emitting radioactive materials, uh, not uh, in explosive form, uh, not in a gigantic form, but it's going to keep emitting that for a thousand years or so. Um, I think the only thing they can do with it is cover it over with cement, like they did at uh, Chernobyl. Well, for people on the West Coast, Canada, and the U.S., how much radiation are they getting right now? If 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 there's radiation being emitted into the atmosphere 24-7, and this has been going on now for two years, then how much of it is falling over the West Coast of the USA and Canada? That's a matter of uh, of dispute. Um, private uh, agencies, uh, scientific agencies, in some cases, not many, have been monitoring um, the fallout because the government is not. Uh, the government is not releasing any monitoring data. Uh, unless it uh, sounds very good. And uh, many, as a matter of fact, uh, a significant number of the normal monitoring stations that the U.S. government keeps uh, running uh, are not running. They have broken or they've been shut down because of sequestration uh, cutbacks, um, and we're not watching it. Uh, but uh, some uh, private agencies have monitored this, and some individuals with uh, uh, household monitors, you can buy them at the Radio Shack, have been keeping check on this. And their data is, uh, I would not say alarming, but it's scary. If you can imagine a scale Mm -hmm. where uh, alarming is uh, you should stay indoors as much as you can. Uh, and and uh, scary is, wow, I'm, gl- I'm sorry that my five-year-old daughter is, has spent the last year in this atmosphere because uh, there is a small chance. It's only a small chance, but there's still a small chance that she will develop uh, childhood leukemia or um, thyroid problems or other uh problems associated with radiation, and there are many, uh, in her lifetime. Is that danger increased during rainfall? Yes, uh, certainly, yes, it brings it down. That was what did so much damage in Belarus and Russia uh, and Ukraine, and uh, also in uh, Fukushima. Um, The uh, government directed people knowingly into the direction of a plume, knowingly is used advisedly. That is, they had information from their, it was called a speedy system, it was a monitoring system, 
uh, that the radiation was going in one direction, the people in the same direction. Um, Why did they do that? I, I recall uh, we reported that. We that cannot event. imagine why. It's unbelievable. Um, the um, well, it, you know to me it's it's equal to um, you know on on September 11, two thousand one when the people inside the World Trade Centers were told to stay in the buildings. Right. It's like yeah. why would you tell anybody to stay in the building? But There's they something. did. They did tell the Japanese people to move towards the the plume. Yes, there is something that uh, sociologists um, have uh, t- uh, named elite panic. Uh, government officials are always worried about the public panicking in emergencies. Uh, uh, the data suggests just the opposite. During emergencies, the public are, that's the real first responders, the person standing next to you. Uh, The public are the best responders. Uh, The official agencies are the ones that panic and tell people to stay in the building or to move in the the wrong direction because uh, they have other data that suggested that evacuation in that direction would be more efficient. Uh, And that elite panic is still going on in Japan. Uh, They did um, uh, sensitive examination of the thyroids of, of, oh, I don't know, 2,300 children. And they discovered that uh, uh, over 40% of them had um, cysts and nodules that were enlarged. But they said, don't panic. As a matter of fact, to prevent people from panicking and thinking of uh, thyroid disease, they did not release the data to the individual people, uh, to the 41% that were, of children that were detected to have these. Those kids, if you were a part of that sample and you wanted to know whether you had enlarged thyroid uh, uh, nodules uh, or growths, you had to go to a private doctor to be tested because the government has panic. Because what are they going to do with those 47%? And this is just a part of the children that were exposed. It wasn't all the children that are exposed. If you catch thyroid cancer uh, early, it's treatable and can be uh, prevented. They're not catching it early. They're not even going to retest these children. And perhaps it has a lot to do with uh, TEPCO being unwilling to accept responsibility for this disaster. Uh, so, So they just basically are in denial of all these things happening. It has to do with that, and it has to do with government expenditures. Yes. They're, uh, they're asking people to move back to, to um, uh, uh, communities that I think, and many, many uh, scientists, experts, doesn't matter what I think, many experts think are dangerous and still have high radiation levels. But if they don't go, if they, uh, don't go back, and they stay away from that danger, they will lose their compensation payments, which are not much, a few thousand dollars a month. Uh, But then the government is running out of money to pay this. So if they tell the people, now you can go back and we no longer have to pay you compensation payments, they will save a lot of money. The Bank of, of Tokyo or Tokyo's banks are going to be busted, and and uh, Japan is uh, financially is has been in dire dire straits for quite some time, and they're they're fighting in deflation, and uh, the last that they need is even greater stress on their economy right now. I'm going to get two more questions in before I, I let you go. Are are we literally on the verge of seeing Japan ceasing to exist as a nation? Is it this serious? Um, if we have a serious accident at the removal uh, uh, thing or a, a serious earthquake, uh, yes. Um, and um, the chances are we will get through it. 
I, I don't think that uh, uh, it's guaranteed that there's going to be a, a nuclear holocaust uh, from uh, these events, uh, but there is a high risk. And we should uh, do everything we can. I've, uh, you know, there's a uh, hundred, hundred. It's uh, I think it's 150,000 of us now have signed a petition to the UN and to Japan to bring in international experts, delay the removal until we have double checked everything, and uh, experimented with everything, done trial runs. Fortunately, they were supposed to start November 8th, uh, but they postponed it for two weeks while they did a trial run. And I think that was a result of the kind of pressure they're getting from uh, petitions like the one I have signed. So there's a lot of concerned people, knowledgeable people, not necessarily experts, but knowledgeable people who are concerned uh, uh, about this. And um, they are not panicking and so we shouldn't panic. Okay, final final question. Aside from reactor number four, which is what we've been talking about today, is there anything else going on with the other reactors, one, two, and three, that that you're concerned about? Absolutely. As one uh, uh, journalist said, uh, uh, reactor number four is the easy job. We can get to those things and pull them out. We know how to do it. There are thousands of these uh, of uh, radioactive uh, 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 fuel rods stuck, buried, melted in units one, two, and three, giving off radiation, and we have no idea, none whatsoever, as to, as to how to handle that. Number four is the easy one. Number four is the easy one. All right, I'm going, to, I'm going to let that be the final, final word on this interview. I think I, I think our audience needs to just pause and contemplate what they've heard here today. Uh, again, Fukushima is not going away, not in our lifetime. Uh, we're going to be dealing with this the rest of our lives. Uh, my guest today, Yale professor, uh, Dr. Charles Perot. Dr. Perot, thank you. Appreciate you taking this time to be with us today. Thank you. I enjoyed getting the message out. Well, looking over my notes, I, I see that the news reports out of Tokyo state that this process will take 18 months. So assuming that it starts at the end of November, 18 months would take us to May 2015. Now, it was either in late 2011 or early 2012. I was praying in our chapel, and I I heard these words in my spirit. I heard the Lord say, radiation, earth changes, do your research, make an intelligent decision. And immediately, an image of the jet stream appeared in my mind. I went straight to my office to the computer, researched the jet stream, and I saw how the northern jet stream swoops down over Fukushima and then out to the Pacific, to Canada and the U.S. And I noticed that there's a northern and southern jet stream And there's a band around the planet north and south of the equator that doesn't have any jet stream activity. But what about the Earth changes? Well, as you know, I believe we've entered a global cooling cycle, and that is greatly impacted by the jet stream. Once again, there is a safe zone in the north and south of the planet along the equator. I'll let you ponder these things. Each person must decide what he or she will do with the information We're on the fast track to the apocalypse. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? 